now at Hanyang University to talk about majority action. Hi. Um, yeah, thank you for the introduction and thanks a lot for the invitation. Yeah, so I, uh, the last time uh, I was here is my, uh, the most recent Blackboard talk of mine <laughs> in front of audiences. Yeah, so I really missed uh, both audiences and the Blackboard. So I'm really happy to um, give a talk here. Yeah, so this is joint work with uh, Deb Takaburti, who's here. Yeah, who's here. And Jonghan Kim, who's at Kias, and Chuan Chan, who's also here. So we, yeah, we have majority of the authors. Uh, <laughs> yeah, here. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, let's start. So, yeah, uh, by the way, I should say that. I've done this work when I was visiting IBS last year. Yeah, pretty much during this time. Yeah, so it's also nice to um, give a talk about what I've done while I visited here. Yeah, so um, let me start by um, saying what is majority dynamics. Yeah, so it's it's a deterministic graph process. Um, so you just start by um, say this graph um, with red colors up here and yellow colors up here. Yeah. Okay. And then what you do is to look at the the opinion, um, either red or yellow. So um, so for this guy, for example, um, the three neighbors, uh, it has three neighbors, and two of them, uh, which is majority, um, is red. Right? So next day, um, this vertex up here will turn red. Yeah. And for the other guys, uh, for example, this one, um, it's tie. Um, so it's yellow, one yellow and one red from the two neighbors, so it remains the same. So it maintains its um, color. And the same thing happens for this one too. Uh, yeah, so, and then for this guy, the, the only neighbor here is yellow, so it remains yellow. Yeah, so this is uh, what happens, so this is what I call uh, day zero day zero and that's day one so yeah so I'm just basically uh, repeating this process uh, for for each day um, so the next day uh, what happens is uh, well everything remains the same because all of these for all of these the majority uh, color in the neighbor is red so all of them are red uh, but this one turns red. Yeah, and then it stays. Yeah, so this is what we call uh, unanimity. So um, this somehow resembles how, uh, for example, some political opinions um, spread. Um, so if your friends, um, like, majority of your friends support uh, for some or voted for some party then it's slightly likely I would say I mean you can keep your opinion but um, you're slightly likely to change your opinion according to the majority opinion of your neighbors yeah yeah sure <laughs> sure that can also happen and that, that pretty much happens a lot <laughs> yeah but uh, I mean yeah, and, and the colors are nothing political here, although <laughs> although we will have presidential election next year. <laughs> I mean, elections happen every year. Last year, um, it was like presidential election in the US. And yeah, so nothing political here about colors. <laughs> yeah, so. Yeah, so let me do another example, which uh, maybe is slightly different, although we have 
the same number of vertices. So we start pretty much uh, with the same setting. Um, so two yellow, two red. Yep. And then what happens is after a day, um, the central vertex of the star turns red and the others turn yellow. And then after one more day, um, they change. All of them changes their colors. Uh, because for this guy, all of the neighbors is yellow. And for these, the, the only neighbor, which is the center vertex, is red. Yeah. And after this, it goes back and forth. So yeah, again, it turns to this shape and then goes back. And so on. So it it makes a uh, periodic behavior. Um, so whereas for this one uh, we reach it unanimity, and um, the rest of days would have uh, just stayed um, in this shape. So there's a, a different behavior on this uh, dynamics. And here's a classical theorem by Golas and Olibos. in 80s, saying that um, given any finite graph G um, and given any the uh, initial assignment S0, say um, these are possible choices of S0, um, I mean this can be formalized as the uh, plus minus functions, pl plus minus one function um, to the vertices. And then uh, the majority dynamics always converges um, to a periodic behavior um, of length at most two. Yeah. So it either stays in the same, not necessarily a unanimity because the components, for example, component-wise, you could have different color. So not necessarily the entire unanimity, but either it stays at some uh, some point um, and never changes, uh, which is a stable state, or uh, there are examples like this. So it oscillates between two different states. So this is a classical result. So Note that we have two things to set up, uh, which are the graph G, the graph G, and the initial opinion S0. So we have uh, so the situation varies depending on what graph G uh, we are using and what S0 we can assign. So there are several possible choices. So for example, for G we can uh, in probabilistic metrics the the most uh, basic example, an interesting one, is the random graph, so the erdős rényi random graph G and T, uh, which means I take n vertices and flip a coin with heads probability P, uh, independently random, to decide uh, whether there is an edge or not. So that's the um, erdős rényi rényi random graph. And for other example, we can also think of uh, some deterministic graph that resembles uh, GNP, like uh, the pseudo-random n b lambda graph. Um, so this means n vertex graph b regular, and lambda is the bound for the second largest eigenvalue. So if lambda being lambda being small uh, means certain pseudo-random property, or you can think of other graphs like Grids, n by n grids, or higher dimensional grids, hypercubes, or tori, and so on. You can just choose your favorite graph to play this majority dynamics. And for the initial assignment S node, you can also um, choose your own. I mean, you you can choose uh, some specific deterministic um, choice of S node. Or you can instead uh, be very random. So 
one again the most um, yeah I, I would say the most um, natural choice um, for those who are doing probabilistic combinatorics is the the random plus minus one assignment independent at random for every vertex yeah so or you could uh, choose the other one or um, you could also think of um, so think about GNP um, so the, the the edges here are independent from the initial assignment so we can just fix one initial assignment plus minus one assignment and then we can toss the coin uh, to decide uh, yeah decide the existence of edges uh, for every pair right so it is okay to just fix some partition say plus ones and minus ones uh, before we we make edges and then and then we can toss a coin co co yeah toss a coin to make edges yeah so uh, for that model we can also think of uh, the the situation that the plus number of plus ones and minus ones are as equal as possible so for n vertices we can think of um, like this many vertices being plus and that many vertices uh, in minus yeah and then we toss a coin uh, to put an edge uh, for every possible pair say here and here and here um, to make a GMP so that's also one possible choice of model um, so we here we want to look at um, the the effect of uh, the difference between the initial plus ones and minus ones um, in GNP in the end. So is that clear? Yeah, so yeah, there are lots of variants of this model and today I'm gonna focus on the most natural ones for me at least um, the, the GNP here and the random plus minus one assignment. Um, although we we have been using some other models like this or that um, yeah on the way um, so the prime yeah the primary concern I'm, I'm yeah I'm primarily concerned with um, those choices um, throughout this talk okay um, so what's next uh, so for this particular choice uh, the first in-depth study uh, was done by um, so here's a conjecture by uh, Benyamini, Chan, um, O'Donnell. Is it double L? I'm a little confused, but I, I hope I am right. If this this is on YouTube on live, so <laughs> I really shouldn't make uh, mistakes in the name. Yeah, these capillary, right? Yeah, good point. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and Tamus and Tan. Tamus Tan. Yeah, I'll, I'll simply call this B C O T T. Yeah, to yeah, to make less effort uh, next time. Yeah. So here's a conjecture. So it's about the G N P and the random plus minus one assignment. So firstly, uh, what they conjectured uh, was if my NP, so it's basically about some, so they, their conjecture says there is a dichotomy uh, between the behavior. I, I mean, the, there are two different behaviors that we can expect uh, where NP goes to infinity or NP um, is, is somewhat bounded. Yeah, so it's bounded by some large constancy. Okay, so what we expect from the first is that um, so with high probability is not really the correct term. Um, let me think. Uh, let's say with high probability. So by with high probability, uh, I mean the probability tends to one as n tends to infinity. Okay. So with high probability, um, so the majority dynamics on G and P. So again, the the assignment here is random. So 
random. Let me just write that. Out. So random uh, plus minus one. Uh, so this is S naught. Okay, then GNP converges to. I would love to say unanimity, but that is not true. Um, so it converges to say 99% agreement with high probability. So why 99%? Because if, uh, unless my P is larger than um, log n over n, um, we have, we, with high probability, we have isolated vertices in GNP. So, and those isolated vertices would never change their color because they're isolated. Yeah, so, yeah, because of that, we, we need this 99% agreement instead of the unanimity. But you can just think of conceptually, it means unanimity. And the second, um, yeah, for the second regime, when NP is bounded, which means essentially uh, your graph has a bounded degree, uh, they conjecture that uh, it's not. With high probability, uh, it doesn't converge. Doesn't converge uh, to 99% agreement. Uh, it's unclear. It's unclear. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I haven't pushed it myself to prove such a thing, but uh, I would say it's, it's unclear. So, I, yeah, we should be careful. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, no, unfortunately. <laughs> Yeah, we, we make some progress towards the conjecture. So, uh, yeah, to that end, um, so let me introduce what they did. So, their theorem. So, yeah, they, they also gave some positive evidence uh, for these conjectures. Um, so, for the first part, um, instead of so this means p, so that means p being asymptotically larger than 1 over n. Yeah, so np goes to infinity means this. And what they did is p is asymptotically larger than 1 over square root of n. Yeah, so which is much, much, much larger than 1 over n. Yeah, under this stronger condition, um, they prove that the probability of unanimity occurs is at least uh, 0.4. Yeah, so it's, um, yeah, the unanimity itself is a stronger condition than the 99% agreement. Uh, but, but I believe that um, unless you are, you go sparser than this, um, there's no like, there's no difference between unanimity and um, I mean for random graphs, um, there's no difference between 99% uh, agreement and unanimity. If you can push, um, yeah, if if you can push to 99% agreement, then it's highly likely that you can push it to unanimity too. Yeah, just yeah. Okay. Anyway, um, they they prove this weaker bound for the probability, which is 0.4, which which is a substantial probability, but not really close to this with high probability, which says one minus little of one. And for the second, um, they gave an example. So uh, this is cheating if I say NP equals four, because what they uh, took is uh, not really a Erdish Rennie random graph, but a uh, random four regular graph. So what they took is the random four regular um, graph on n vertices, and what they proved was there are two cycles 
uh, with high probability that um, one cycle is entirely yellow and the other is entirely red. Yeah, because it's full regular for those vertices um, in the, these cycles, it's at least high. So these are four regular, so it looks like this. And because the two neighbors are already yellow um, in here, um, the, the vertices in here stays in yellow, and here it stays in red. So they never change, so they never really converge to this 99% agreement. Um, so these cycles have substantial portion. Yeah, so this is one um, like positive evidence for both conjectures. So this was with the random assignment of minus one and one? Or? Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, so let me move. Then, yeah, and then this theorem by uh, those five people uh, was pushed further by. Again, I should be careful about the, how to spell the names. <laughs> so here's a theorem by Font Lakis. Font Lakis. Um, Mi Hyun Kang, and so I, I should say Mi Hyun Kang, yeah, and Makai, yeah, in last year. So it's, yeah, it's submitted two years ago and then published it last year. So what they proved is under the same condition, um, P is asymptotically larger than 1 over square root of n. They push it this number to one minus little of one. So they they push it that number. So the probability of unanimity now is one minus little of one. Yeah. So they they prove the conjecture in the uh, region where uh, p is asymptotically larger than one over square root of n. Yeah. So this is a partial um, result uh, for the conjecture. And then this after this result was archived, it was reproved twice by different um, disjoint group at Yale. So by uh, Lin Chan. Uh, so yeah, he's not our Chan. <laughs> yeah, so and Ban Bu. Um, and by Berkowitz um, and Devlin. Yeah, those two disjoint groups at Yale University, um, they reproved this result um, twice um, in a different way. Uh, but very roughly um, speaking, um, their model, um, their approach relates to this kind of sharper uh, model I um, explained very briefly. So their model is to look at the constant difference. So you just fix uh, plus ones and minus ones and say you have um, at least three more plus ones than minus ones. And you want to uh, chase, uh, chase the effect of those three um, after um, sufficiently many days, yeah, or or six or nine. So their model is to fix some constant um, difference between the number of plus ones and minus ones, and you look at some you look at G and P, and and you want to examine the the probability that G and P reaches unanimity. 
Yes, so this is somewhat sharper in the sense that if I do this just randomly, if I ask, if I, um, yeah, if I assign plus ones and minus ones uh, randomly, then there's a um, unavoidable, sort of unavoidable uh, deviation uh, between plus ones and minus ones, which we call um, standard deviation. So if I do this randomly, then um, for fairly small constant, say, uh, say epsilon square root of n, yeah, so for a fairly small epsilon, or I can take my epsilon to be any um, constant that tends to zero, uh, then with high probability there exists a at least this much difference between the number of plus ones and minus ones. That's because uh, my square root of n here is the standard deviation. Yeah, of the random plus minus one, one variable. Um, yeah, like independent sum of n plus minus one variables. So. Initially, you say that half of the things are going to be plus ones randomly, and half are going to be minus ones randomly instead of grouping with one of each one. Take the change. Uh, one. yeah, they're all, all equivalent because um, this kind of fix is doesn't really. Uh, I mean, it's independent from from our edges. So, yeah, you you can you can yeah you yeah yeah there are two ways. You can just fix one vertex set like this, or you can just like assign plus minus ones. Uh, with a fixed number of uh, plus ones and minus ones randomly. So mm -hmm. yeah, yes. they're equivalent, they're, they're exactly the same. But yeah. Do we know this result in the case that say n is even and you have exactly a number two plus one and exactly a number two minus um, I mean, because of symmetry, uh, the, the probability when you have exactly the same plus ones and minus ones is exactly a half. Uh, no. Right, but it's a question of exactly any unity, right? Yeah, that I'm not so sure. Yeah, so the, yeah, as you say, the question is if the, it goes to unanimity in either side, not so sure. Yeah. Yeah, but there's a result, there's a very recent result saying um, if we have at least one one more plus ones and minus ones, then it converges to unanimity uh, for G and half, or some G and P where P is sufficiently um, yes dense. Yeah, so I'll, I'll get back to that um, in the last five minutes or so. So let me move on. So they reproved the result by considering this somewhat sharper model. So that was what um, had been known um, for um, 2020, I think. Yeah, and here p equals 1 over um, square root of n. So this number here has been a barrier uh, for this argument to work. Um, so to cite a paper by Shelley, um, and uh, Durba and Bontlakis um, uh, on some variants of this model and mainly about majority dynamics. They said that um, the p is sparser than 1 over square root of n um, imposes um, immense complication. Yeah, so that was what they said. Yeah, and here's our result. So here's a theorem um, of ours. So what's the correct order? So it's step first and then Jonghan and myself and and Tuan. Yeah, so here's our result, um, 2021 plus. Um, so we prove that um, if my uh, p 
is between these um, say uh, I mean we can put some constants here but um, let's say um, this is the this is our range um, so just not to confuse you let me just stick to this yeah so in this uh, range of P uh, we prove that the unanimity unanimity um, occurs with high probability. So again, the setting is uh, GNP and the random plus minus one assignment. Yeah. So this really goes beyond. Uh, this is the first result that goes beyond this one over square root of n. And together with the result um, by these people, yeah, these people, which uh, was reproved by these groups, um, we, as a corollary. Is it visible mm, up there? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. As a corollary, we conclude that uh, that conjecture, the the BCOTT conjecture, first part, um, is true for p larger than log n over n to the um, three fifths. So this is our result, uh, which pushes uh, more. But but still, um, this the yeah it, it's far from uh, one over n. So yeah, uh, the the conjecture remains open. Yeah. So hope that's not too disappointing for you, Pascal. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So. I don't have some time. So let me um, explain a little bit more about our proof strategy. But uh, to before that, let me explain uh, what's behind um, this conjecture over here. So this is what I call the BCOTT heuristic, um, which uh, was introduced in this paper. Um, and let me just explain why they conjectured so. So suppose uh, I resample uh, my GNP uh, before um, each day to proceed. So that's not allowed, um, of course. That's not allowed. Uh, but as a model, um, if you believe that um, the, the, the behavior of colors and your graph is somewhat ir irrelevant, your GNP and the, the distribution of colors is somewhat irrelevant, which is again not really true. But uh, just for simplicity, um, let's say uh, we just resample our GNP um, at like every night to proceed. Okay. Then what happens is so we start from some portion of um, yellows and reds. So say this is day zero. And we can consider a bipartite model for this. Um, so here's my day one. And between these two, I just sample, uh, I'm, I'm just considering a random bipartite graph. I just flip a coin for every crossing pair uh, to decide put an edge or not. Okay. And, and then um, according to the majority colors on the neighborhood, I Decide the color of this guy, um, yeah, and then it would it might change like this. The portion might be changing like this, and so on. So this is the picture that we can draw from the BCOTT heuristic. So it if it goes on like this, um, so what what we expect from each day is we, we expect uh, that the, the majority color, say yellow here, expands uh, a little bit by a multiplicative factor. Yeah, so that's what we expect. And let me do a little bit of calculation um, to show that, um, yeah, not really show, but I mean, not, not really mathematically showing, but yeah, sh show you that 
uh, it makes certain sense. So what happens here is for each vertex v here, um, so I'm, I'm basically doing some binomial model. So um, I'm looking at two, two binomial variables. So the first one being uh, I'm counting the number of yellow neighbors. Okay, that's my x sub b. And second, I'm counting the red neighbors. Okay, and then um, what, what I do for this vertex v is if x v minus y v is strictly larger than zero, then v turns um, yellow on the on the next day because it, the majority um, in the, the neighbor is yellow. Okay, so is that clear? Yeah, so then we should uh, compute the probability. So what we should do is to compute the probability of this event. Mm -hmm. And how do we compute this um, event? Well, um, this, these are binomial variables, and we can um, consider some normal approximation by looking at their um, expectation and variance. And yeah, we we use the yeah we use normal approximation to compute this probability. So that's the basic strategy. So to that end, uh, we need to compute the expectations and the variance. Right. So what's the expectation of this one? So this one, for example, um, so the expectation is um, y minus b uh, r. Sorry, y minus r times p. By linearity of expectation, we have this number. So let's say this is the initial shift uh, mu naught. Okay. Then we have is it mu naught or mu naught n? Uh, maybe maybe mu naught n. So I, I have to scale down uh, the number of vertices n here. So it's the 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 normalized discrepancy between plus plus ones and minus ones. That's what I call mu, mu naught. Okay. Then what I have is mu naught times n p. So that's my expectation. And what's the variance? So what's the variance? Uh, so the variance is um, roughly NP. So XV and YV are independent. Um, so I can add up the variance of the two. And, and then the, the variance of binomial variable is rough, like NP times 1 minus P. Yeah, but I'm ignoring the, the constant vectors here and yes. Yeah, and it's it's some constant times n p, um, if you believe me. Yeah, so these are the numbers we have, and then by the normal approximation, what we can do um, is this is larger than this is a standard normal variable, and we divide that by so that's the shift we want the n p mu zero, and we divide that by the standard deviation. And that's the number. And by using some Taylor series, you, we, you can just compute that the probability is half times square root of NP um, times mu naught. So which means, um, so yeah, the calculation here is all, all sloppy and um, I'm ignoring all the constants. Yeah, but what it essentially means is the shift from mu naught the, the discrepancy between plus ones and minus ones expand by a factor of square root of NP. So what I expect for mu one is square root of NP times mu naught. So that's the, the heuristic. And as long as my square root of NP is large, uh, it's so large that uh, it tends to infinity, then uh, because it expands by roughly a factor of square root of NP, um, I mean, it should beat the, all the hidden constants like hidden up here. And hence, uh, the yellow proportion 
would converge to one because it's increasing um, yeah, every time. So that's the heuristic behind um, this uh, conjecture. Okay, um, so what we've done uh, for this statement uh, is roughly, so this is again a very rough statement. So we, we proved this statement, the, the heuristic uh, works uh, up to day two. Yeah, so we, we follow this heuristic uh, and we, we examine the shift uh, from, from the initial day to up here um, within uh, when, when our P is within this range. Yeah. So the reason I explain this is um, when, yeah, when solving this problem, I mean, at least partially, um, you need to work out some num some numbers. You need to work out some numbers, and you you make a uh, statement that you want to prove uh, by using p's and n's. Yeah, and this is what you expect. So initially, your u naught here is a one over um, square root of n because you have a square root of n discrepancy. And do you have any question? Uh, this heuristic suggests that if n p was like two, that you would still that it would still eventually converge to. Uh, yeah. I mean, n p equals say a thousand might might be, but just in yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm not so sure. It. They, I mean, it's a heuristic, so okay, it's yeah, so it might. Yeah, I think it might not work for two sparse graphs. Right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I think, and that's what these five people thought. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. So that's that's probably the case. Yeah, uh, yeah where were we? Um, yeah, so we are keep tracking um, the statements we want according to this heuristic. So on the first day, um, it's certainly 1 over square root of n. And on the second day, we would have the shift of um, square root of p. And the second day, we would have um, square root of n times p. Yeah. Something like this. So this is what we expect from our numbers. And we proved uh, such a result. So how much time do I have? Maybe 10 minutes? Uh, yeah. Okay, yeah. So let me explain more about our strategy. So as I sketched, um, our strategy is somewhat uh, related to uh, this one, the, the sharper model. So what we are going to do is to um, yeah, follow the this multiverse trend, <laughs> and we we introduce <laughs> yeah we, we introduce two parallel universes. Yeah, so we um, so what we denote by R naught is that we we assign plus ones and minus ones um, as equal as possible. Yeah, as we equal as possible, and and then we we proceed. Um, um, by using G and P in this model. And then um, what's S naught um, tilde, which is not exactly the S naught we have, um, but what we do is to um, impose, so we, we take a certain number of, um, say, minus ones, yeah, which stands for, say, red. So here, these are red and these are yellow. And we take a portion of uh, random vertices uh, within these red vertices and turn them yellow, like artificially. We, we choose, so what's S0? We choose um, square root of n um, what, red vertices 
n at random, at random, and turn them uh, yellow. Yeah. By doing so, we artificially make a discrepancy. So where our yellow vertices, um, the number of yellow vertices is larger than the red ones by the margin of two times square root of n. I mean, I'm, again, um, hiding some constants up here. Yeah. yeah, so this is the model here. And what I want is to keep chasing on these um, swing vertices. So they, they change their mind, and they, they have an effect on the, the future. So I'm comparing um, these two um, by chasing um, this, by looking at this parallel universe. So what do I mean by that? So what I mean is um, the following. So suppose, uh, so suppose there's a vertex here, which has a certain number of neighbors. Um, typically, it has NP neighbors. Um, and then uh, we look at the second neighbor. Okay, and there's a probability that we can compute uh, that this guy here, which is a neighbor of this, uh, is red, um, initially red, and its neighbor is exactly half yellow and half red. So it's it's divided. So we can compute such tie probability. So that's a standard um, thing. And then uh, what you can also compute is what's the probability. Um, yeah, let's use yellow. We can further um, compute the probability that there is a swing vertex that changes from red to yellow in this, um, yeah, in this tie situation. So in this tie situation, so when, when red and yellow are just tie, um, if one turns yellow uh, from red to yellow, then, then this guy becomes yellow in the next day. And then, if um, there are the dis the discrepancy in in this neighborhood is uh, leaning slightly towards yellow, so which means the sum of um, sum of r one um, b in say this is u. Yeah. So this is not, it, it's close to be positive, not really exactly positive. Um, so if, if the number here is close to be positive, then because there are many such neighbors that turns on the, uh, on the, sec on the first day, uh, by the effect of swing neighbors, it turns um, yellow uh, from red to yellow. So yeah, probably I'm messing around too much. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, so what I'm comparing is this model. So yeah, in this universe, um, this vertex here would probably happily um, stay red. Yeah. Whereas in the parallel universe, um, this red vertex will change its opinion to yellow by the effect of the swing vertices. I changed. Yeah. So what I want to do is to compute the number of those uh, those uh, vertices u, such that uh, the sum of uh, yeah the sum of the signs in the neighborhood, which means the discrepancy between the colors, is uh, not not exactly positive, but not very much negative. So it's almost positive. So this is a small number. Yeah, so it's almost a positive. And then um, by analyzing the effect of those swing vertices, I can say that in the parallel universe, um, this has lots of red neighbors, which is enough to turn this 
uh, vertex to yellow. So these will turn yellow in the first day, and hence it turns uh, yellow in the second day because um, this neighbor has a small discrepancy leaning towards uh, the, the yellow side. Yeah, so that's very rough sketch of the argument. And let me just wrap up um, by saying a few things. Um, so here, here are some open problems. Um, so obviously, this conjecture remains open. Yeah, yeah, so this conjecture remains open, and yeah, and you might wonder why we need this uh, number n to the three fifths in the denominator. Uh, that comes from a couple of technical reasons. That comes from a couple of technical reasons by um, we are using Chebyshev plus. Um, the Barry Essen inequality for normal approximations. And um, yeah, I, I would say it appears uh, not very philosophically, but on along the way, uh, along the technical way, we execute um, these computations. Um, so if one takes a new approach to prove the same result, uh, then it might give uh, more region where uh, the BCOTT conjecture is true. Um, so this remains open. And um, there is another related problem, uh, which is this. What if you have a constant discrepancy? You just fix the constant discrepancy, and you look at uh, g and half. Um, and then you wonder uh, if this constant, say, equals 9 or 10 or even 5 or 2, 1. Um, they, they have some effect on your random graph um, to reach the unanimity in majority dynamics. And yeah, this there was a conjecture by Tran and Drew um, saying um, the smallest possible discrepancy is uh, enough to guarantee that G and half uh, converges to unanimity. Unanimity, yeah, with probability, say, slightly larger than a half. And this was very recently proved um, by uh, graduate students at MIT um, who are asking and meta -psi. again I should be looking at the spelling yes yeah so these guys prove this conjecture uh, in a stronger form uh, which in fact proves one minus little of one and um, there are substantially new ideas therein um, but I, I don't know if uh, their result uh, can be transferred to this um, sparse setting or not. So it would be interesting to see if uh, it has some applications on this um, sparse random graphs too. Yeah. Yeah, so this is it, I think. Yeah. And yeah, thank you. So why two days? Why do you go with two? Why is it enough to show two days? Why do you have to show? Oh, I see. So, so 
until two days we we analyze like this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and after that we have uh, sufficiently large uh, discrepancy uh, to conclude just by using some pseudo-random property of random guys. Mm -hmm. So we, we applied some um, yeah some some result uh, for pseudo-random graphs. Is it and then is that a feature of how large P is if P was smaller, maybe you would have to track it even more days. Yeah, 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 that that might be the case, and, and, and it makes the problem um, harder. Or or you have to chase the longer neighborhood um, than this. Right. Yeah, so that makes uh, the problem much harder. Uh, yeah, when it comes to to smaller P. Yeah. If you increase the number of colors. should be one, but I don't remember the result. Mm -hmm. uh, do people consider it either a random graph but a non-random assignment? So you're, you're trying to create some non-unanimous uh, so assignment? You, you want to uh, create a uh, assignment, initial assignment, depending on what your yeah. graph is. And yeah, that's also a nice question. Yeah, but I mean, if you look at such a game kind of behavior, then I think um, you could, I mean, I have never tried, but uh, my kind of feeling is that you can cook up some, um, some examples. My feeling is, uh, if I have a freedom to choose the colors, then um, yeah, like yeah, that that freedom would be quite large. Yeah, so like so, that. I so is it known? Is there any graph where every assignment converges to unanimity? Uh, so I guess. Uh, Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's a real one graph, but <laughs> yeah. maybe um, uh, is it an odd fleet? <laughs> if it's if it's odd, because because if it's even, then yeah. Uh, no wait. Uh, well, you can also make yeah. this problem. Uh, no, it's so so it's certainly if it's even, and I have exactly half and half in yeah. each color. You can't. That's not going to converge to unanimity. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, it was that, that that was that was tough there. Um, yeah. If it's odd, I guess it should converge to unanimity. Yeah. Uh, so there's a question in the live chat. So also iterating Tanya's kind of question about multiple colors, but also about maybe are there variants with uh, where they only swap with uh, swap colors by the stronger majority. So say seventy percent. Oh Do yeah. Yeah. Colors? I, yeah, there are again, there, there may be such variants, but I think it's worth uh, having a look at this paper, which includes lots of variants um, like this. Yeah, so, yeah, I, I should have done um, <laughs> serious um, <laughs> literature review. <laughs> 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 yeah, very good point. <laughs> yeah, I should have looked at the proof. Uh, I actually once uh, searched for the paper, and actually what's happening in the paper, as far as I remember, I roughly remember, um, it's not written in this language. Yeah, it's oh. yeah, it's stated in a little bit somewhat, a little bit different language. Um, so. Yeah, again, I, I <laughs> apologize for my, my laziness. <laughs> yeah, but I, I, yeah, I, at the time, I, I, yeah, I stopped reading um, this literature because <laughs> it's written slightly differently. Yeah, yeah. yeah.
yeah, but uh, but it would be interesting to understand the proof. Uh, yeah, I, I do agree. Yeah, I, especially if you want to um, prove the second part or um, do something similar. Um, yeah, so, yeah. This is not really the oscillation example, but um, yeah. But if you want to prove some sparse graph really oscillates between two different states, then probably um, you're right. Um, you you should be looking at these um, this classical theorem by Golas and Olivos, and that should be the starting.